Good morning, TNCC, and those of you who are joining us uh, online um, through uh, home at church. It's so good to be uh, together in this manner, it, notwithstanding that uh, we are physically restrained. But I just thank God for this opportunity to be able to speak to all of you. I trust uh, you have been blessed by the praise and worship and the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Um, you know, I just uh, before I start this morning, I just want to say that our God is a good God. Our God is a faithful God and He wants all of us to put our trust in Him, to put our faith in Him, uh, to believe that He is more than able to help us in these difficult times that we are all facing right now. The danger, uh, the, the, the lack and, and the problems uh, with employment and business. Um, God wants to reassure us that He is more than able to help us at this time. He wants us to put Jesus as our foundation so that when the storm comes, you know, the storm uh, is here everywhere, in fact, the whole world, and we are facing the same storm. But because we put our trust in Jesus as our foundation, as our rock, our house will still stand when the storm comes. It will not fall flat. Amen? So this morning, I, I pray and trust that as uh, we go through God's Word, we will be blessed, we will be encouraged, we will be able to see how good our God is, how lovely Jesus is, and how much He loves each and every one of us. This morning, we are continu continuing with the series on the book of Romans. Uh, I'll be doing Romans chapter 4. Last Sunday, Pastor Peter led us through Romans 3. Okay. And in chapter 3, Paul very clearly states that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and none is righteous. So because of sin, all of us deserve uh, punishment. And you know the punishment of sin is death. Okay? When Adam fell, God said, uh, before Adam fell, he says not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat it, you will surely die. And so death uh, entered the human race, sin entered the human race, and, and because of that, uh, you know, we are judged by the law. Because uh, the law cannot justify uh, a sinner, and we are all sinners because of the fall of Adam. And on top of that, you know, the law is perfect. And when Jesus was on this earth, um, he, when he spoke to the, the people there, especially on the, uh, on the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5, he gave a lot of examples as to what is actually the true um, standard of God in the law. And he gave many examples like if, you, if your hand causes you to, to sin, you chop it off. If your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out. And he says that if you look at a woman in lust, you have already committed adultery. So the st God's standard is much more than what we are known to, to, to know about laws and regulations. Normally, you have, to, um, you have to commit the crime, you have to commit the, the act before you are found guilty. But as far as, far as God is concerned, even if you think of doing something that is bad, that is wrong, you are already guilty. So by right, when, when Jesus appeared to them and told them the actual standards of the law, uh, we should have come, especially the, the, the Jews, should have come to the end of themselves and said that this is too difficult for me to obey based on my own strength. I need I need help, I need grace, I need God to give me grace and mercy so that I can be accepted, I can be, that I can have a right standing with God. Uh, but unfortunately, this was not done. But praise be to God, uh, you know, at the right time, God sent Jesus to, to come down on this earth 
to be our sacrifice, to pay the penalty of our sins. You know? And not only that, uh, he came also to give us his righteousness in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what Jesus came to do. And, and we learn that today, justification, righteousness is only by faith. Okay? It's only by faith. In Romans 3.28, we, we learned last week that, uh, that we only can be righteous, we only can be justified uh, to, by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no other way that we can, we can do it. Now, for those who think that we need the law to be righteous, we need the law to be holy, we need the, the law to keep us on track, uh, then, you know, uh, you know, Paul says, it is the goodness in Romans chapter 1. He says, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance, not the threat of punishment. In fact, Jesus says that the person who has been forgiven much will love much. I just want to give one example uh, from the Bible. Um, we all know Zacchaeus. Okay? Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was working for the Roman Empire, collecting taxes for, for the Roman Empire. And the people despised him because he was, he, he was like a bit, uh, you know, he betrayed his own people. You know, he collected taxes from the, the poor and in fact collected more than, than what he should have collected. And so he was despised. And one day Jesus was just coming along and he heard that Jesus was coming, but he wanted to see Jesus. But because of his short stature uh, and because the people didn't like him and despised him. He had no chance to go through the crowd to see Jesus. So what he did was he climbed up a sycamore tree to try to look to Jesus. And when Jesus came by, Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down now. I, I must come to your house today. And Zacchaeus came down. How did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? The Bible doesn't mention that, you know, he, that Jesus knew his name, but he called him and God noticed that he was there trying to look for, for Jesus, trying to see Jesus. You know, it's very comforting that whenever we just look to Jesus, whenever we just have uh, our, our interest in finding him out of Jesus, he will come straight to us. He is always waiting to be there for us, to bless us, to, to have fellowship with us. And so Jesus called out to Zacchaeus and he came down. And you know what Zacchaeus declared immediately? He said, half of the, the, my, my wealth I give to the poor. And uh, whoever I have cheated, I will repay back them four times. Now, under the, the law, a person is only required to pay back what they have stolen plus 20% of what they, they, they took. So it will be 120% only. That was the requirement of the law if they had stole property. Not, not animals, but just uh, property like money. And, but here, you can see that Zacchaeus gave more than what the law required. He gave four times. That means it's 400%. You know, when God, when Jesus gave grace and and. and acceptance to Zacchaeus that transformed him actually immediately within a minute or so okay it's unheard of from a person who loves money who worships money from a sinner who is despised from a, a person who uh, you know probably cheat, cheated a lot of people of money suddenly he became very generous and this is why you know the law cannot help us to be righteous. Only by the grace of God, by, by God's grace that we are able to keep the law. Amen? Okay. So, we come to Romans chapter 4. And in Romans chapter 4, Paul starts up by, uh, by using Abraham as an example of being, uh, being credited with God's righteousness. Okay? So he, he asked this question, what about Abraham's righteousness? Okay, 
What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, Paul is saying that uh, Abraham received uh, righteousness from God because he believed. Okay? And then we see, uh, we also see David says the same thing. He says, Blessed is the man who God credits righteousness apart from works. So Paul is trying to link the righteousness by faith that was uh, introduced in the gospel uh, through Jesus Christ to the patriarchs of the, the Jews, to Abraham and David, because Abraham was considered by the Jews as the father of the Jewish nation. So they respected Abraham. And they also respected King David. He's one of the greatest king of Israel. And Paul is trying to say, look, this concept or this principle of righteousness by faith is not something new that just came about, but it has been uh, revealed through the scriptures. It's been revealed uh, through the apostles, to, to the matriarchs of, of old in the Old Testament. And here, Paul is trying to convince them that you know, look, your father of, uh, of the Jewish nation, was credit, he was the first person to be credited with God's righteousness. So, Paul then asked the question, because his, his crowd, probably the, the Jewish uh, Christians, or, or they still think that they need to obey the law, and, and some of them, you know, probably had... Uh, use the law to make them righteous or feel righteous. And, and Paul says in verse 4 that, Now to whom who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Now the word credited or accounted or imputed is a very is an accounting term. So if you Somebody credits money to you, especially your salary, at the end of the month. You know, this money, this, this uh, salary that is credited is because you had worked for it. You earn it. Okay? So your boss cannot come and tell you that, you know, this is a gift. No, no, it, you earn it. But in Abraham's case, righteousness was credited to him because of faith, not because... Abraham was righteous, and we will also see that uh, it was not uh, his righteousness that God credited this righteousness. You know that uh, subsequently, uh, you know, because God had promised Abraham that he would be uh, blessed, he would be a great, uh, nation, uh, a great nation, and he would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth, and God would give him a son. So when, only when uh, Isaac was born maybe uh, uh, after 25 years when the, promise, when the first promise was made to Abraham. And when Isaac was only 14 years old, that he, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac because God told him to do that. But his obedience was much, much later on. So it's got nothing to do with how God credited his righteousness. And then we look also, uh, Paul also brings up the issue of circumcision. Um, that is also another uh, thing that they are, they are disputing, whether a believer should be circumcised or whether they should follow the law. And so Paul brings this up again and says that, look, was Abraham righteous before he was circumcised or after? And he clearly says that, under verse 10, he says, under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. So Paul lays down this ground. Look, Abraham was credited with righteousness even before he was uh, circumcised. So the context here is, Righteousness was credited before any works. As I mentioned, before he was circumcised, 
And even uh, before he was obedient unto God to sacrifice Isaac, and it was also credited before the law was given. I always wonder why, why did God introduce righteousness by faith before the law was, uh, was, was given and then it just stopped there and then the law took over. But I believe the reason being is that God wants to show us that, wants to show those law-keeping people that it is possible to be righteous by faith without the law. That's why it was, it was uh, Abraham was deemed righteous before the law was given. So, it is very clear now that Abraham is the father of all. That means whether you are uncircumcised or whether you are circumcised. And uh, he is our example that if we believe God, and we, if we believe his righteousness, I mean his promises, God will credit his uh, righteousness towards us. But what has got circumcision got to do with righteousness? I was just thinking, you know, all this circumcision, non-circumcision, what, what is this, all this circumcision is all about? How is it connected with righteousness? How is it connected with Righteousness by faith. And in verse 11, it says, Abraham received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So, okay, I understand that, you know, this is a sign to, to confirm that Abraham received righteousness without works, that Abraham received righteousness by faith. But it still didn't answer my query. What has circumcision got to do with righteousness? And then, of course, it's so obvious <coughs> that, you know, the act of circumcision is the cutting of the foreskin. It's the cutting of the flesh. Meaning, circumcision is a, a sign to say that righteousness is without the works of the flesh. We cannot, have, we cannot obtain righteousness by the workings of the flesh. So the flesh needs to be cut off. So by cutting off the foreskin, it is a picture of cutting off works of the flesh from the gift of righteousness. Amen? So I believe that's the reason why God instituted uh, uh, this circumcision. But you, know, but you know that today... The Jews still circumcise the male after the eighth day when, when, when the baby, male baby is born. And, um, and the thing is, in the time of Jesus, um, there's one occasion where, um, you know, Jesus always, he healed many times on the Sabbath day. And under the law, you have to keep the Sabbath, you have to obey, you should not uh, do any work. And um, Jesus always healed uh, on the Sabbath, and they always criticized Jesus for breaking the law. And you would think that hmm, it appears that Jesus is breaking the law because they are not supposed to do any work. And the Bible says that Jesus said that he has come, he came to not to abolish the law, but to keep the law, to fulfill the law. So why is that this uh, contradiction? And, and then at one time, Jesus replied by saying that Moses allowed circumcision on Sabbath because if the, the baby was born and on the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, they would circumcise the, the male baby even on a Sabbath. And they do it. And that they do not think as violating the law. So when Jesus said that, they couldn't reply. But I want to say that the circumcision on the Sabbath and Jesus' healing on, on, on the Sabbath is not a violation of the law. The reason I say this is because the Sabbath is supposed to be God's rest for us. That means we come to the end of ourselves. 
we come to the end of ourselves and say that we need to enter God's rest. And God's rest meaning it is based on the finished work of Jesus. He has done all the work for salvation. He has done all the work for creation. We only need to come and rest in His finished work. That's why we cannot add flesh into it. We cannot add works into salvation. We cannot add uh, you know, uh, our contribution towards the finished work, towards salvation. It has to be a total rest. And that Sabbath rest is representing that. So that's why the Sabbath rest, Sabbath law says that no one can work on the Sabbath. So praise be to God, you know, the healing that Jesus did for us, the, the healing that Jesus did on the Sabbath for the different people is a picture of God's, uh, God's rest because His healing is, is not based on our performance, it's not based on our goodness, but it's based on what Jesus did on the cross for us. It's by His stripes we are healed. You know, it is by His grace that we receive healing. It is by faith we receive His healing. And the circumcision is a sign that we should not uh, include the works of the flesh uh, in obtaining God's rest. So those two, two uh, things do not actually violate the Sabbath. So now we come to verse 16. It says, Therefore, the promise to Abraham comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. We are all Abraham's offspring. And so those of us who also believe in God, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, have received the righteousness of God by faith. Amen? And not only that, God also says that God's uh, promise to us, God's promises, similarly the promises made to, to Abraham and the promises made to us, there are so many promises in the Bible, it's all by grace and it's guaranteed to all of us when we believe. Amen? So both obtaining righteousness, obtaining the promises of God, is nothing to do with the works of man, but it is through our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about having the right believing, having uh, our, our trust in, in the Lord that we receive His righteousness, that we receive His blessing. Amen? But you tell me, you ask me, <laughs> is righteousness relevant what if righteousness is credited to me you might say and uh, you know i wish money was credited to me uh, i need a job i lost just lost my job i need a raise you know so that i can feed my family i i need more business because the business is really down at the moment or i need healing right now because i'm suffering you know we have all so many needs and you might say what is this righteousness good for me? What can it do for me? Yes, I believe God and I've, I've been saved. My sins are washed away. I, 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 I have eternal life. I'm going to heaven. But while I'm here, I'm suffering. I, I need help. I need answers. I need you know, God to be real in my life. You know, in, in, in a sense that when, when I, I need help, I need God to, to help me. And you know, that is the very purpose that righteousness was imputed on us. Because when we are righteous, we are supremely blessed. We are royally blessed. Paul says, he quotes David from uh, Psalm 32, and he puts it in verse 7. He said, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered, blessed again, is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them, will never impute against them. 
Instead, he will impute righteousness. So two things that Jesus did for us. He forgave our sins and uh, he covered our sins by, by dying on the cross for our sins. He paid the penalty of our sins so that we have been forgiven, so that we are, uh, are free you know, from, from the, the condemnation, from, from the, uh, the effects of the penalty of sin. Okay? And then what he did also was he imputed his righteousness on us. So, you know, um, when Christ died, he was totally righteous. He was without sin, but he took on sin. You know, we were, we were imputed with sin when Adam fell. By one man's offense, all sin, but by one man's righteousness, all can, all can be righteous. And so because of the righteousness of Jesus, death could not hold him down. He defeated death and rose again on the third day. And his resurrection is our resurrection because of his righteousness. And because his righteousness has been imputed on us, today we are also righteous before God. And Paul says that we are supremely blessed because of this. Paul also says in Psalm chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Surely you bless the righteous, you surround them with your favour as a shield. You know, when we are righteous, God surrounds us with His favour. Who needs favour in your lives? You know, when we have a business deal, we need favour. When we have a difficult situation with our bosses, we need favour. When we are in, a, in, in trouble, we need favour. So the favour of God is like, it, it just surrounds us because we are righteous. Not because we are righteous, but because Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. And you remember, un, in, under the Old Covenant, in Deuteronomy 28, God says that if you obey my commandments under the law, you will be blessed. You'll be blessed in, in, uh, in whatever you do. You're going out and coming in. You'll be blessed in, in your, your stocks, in your family, in in your business, you know, in your um, posterity, you know, your health, your longevity, you're all blessed. So because we are righteous right now by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the law says that you are justified. You can receive all these blessings. That's why the blessings are, prompt, are guaranteed to us because of the righteousness that has been imputed on us. We can stand and claim all these promises in the, under the law because God will have to bless us because His law says so. Amen? And he, at the same time, He took the curses by His suffering on the cross. He was pierced, He was wounded, He was beaten, He was bruised, and by His stripes, we are healed. He was made poor so that we can be rich. That's how good our God is to us. And that's why we are supremely blessed. So all the more you need God's righteousness. In Matthew it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you have God's righteousness, it is like a magnet. It will attract God's provision. And you remember, you remember when the first Passover when they put the blood on the lentil, the doorpost, and when the spirit of death, the angel of death came, when they saw the blood, it says, you know, there's already a death in this house. I, I will pass by. I won't kill anymore because the death has happened in this house. The death of the lamb. And we know that this is a picture of the death of the Lamb of God, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us on the cross. And when God sees the, the blood, He knows that the penalty has been paid. And then that same night, they ate the burnt lamb as a burnt offering. You know, it pic it's a burnt offering is a picture of God's suffering, our, Jesus suffering the curses and His righteousness. And you know what happened? The next day when they left 
uh, Egypt, when they were free, they were set free from slavery, they came out with gold and silver. They, pl the, 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 they plundered the gold and silver from the Egyptians. And none were, were weak or feeble. You know, so they had provision, they had gold and uh, they had provision, gold and silver, and they had healing, they had health. None were weak and feeble. So it is when you receive God's righteousness, you know, all these things will be added unto you. So it is very relevant that we all have uh, the righteousness of God and that we believe in the promises of God. Okay. Then, you know, even though God gave the promise to, uh, to Abraham, but Abraham had many obstacles in front of him. You know, in verse 20, it says, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in the faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as, un as uh, righteousness. You know, Abraham was already very old. And Sarah was also very old and beyond her childbearing age. On top of that, she was barren, meaning she never gave birth before. So she was doubly dead. Plus, Abraham's old age, you know, it would be it would seem impossible for Abraham to have a child, to have a son. But he did not focus on his, his difficulty that was against him, but he persuaded himself that God, who made the promise, is more than able to perform the promise for him. He believed God would do it. He didn't know how, but he tried once, but that was not the way. In the end, he had to rely on God. And because he believed God, God said that he was credited with righteousness. And he became the father of many nations. Sometimes we may go through uh, difficulties, and even though with God's promises that by his stripes we are healed, he will supply all my... Uh, needs according to his riches in glory, but when we see our bank account, when we see our physical condition, our sickness, the, the doctor's report, you know, uh, it's so difficult to believe God's promises. And I uh, just want to encourage you to call forth, call forth uh, the things that look dead, you know, and give life to it. That, because God himself, in verse 17, he says, God who gives life to the Okay, God, in verse 17, it says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You know, God says, change your name to, from Abraham to Abraham. And Abraham means the father of many nations. You know, and ask Sarah to change her name from Sarai to Sarah, meaning princess. So God calls the dead uh, as though they exist. And in the end, you know, they came about, you know, God fulfilled His promises. So we need not to look at our circumstances, but to look at God's promises. Okay? What did Abraham believe? In Genesis 15, 5, he says, God took him outside and said, Look up the sky and count, and count uh, the stars. If you indeed can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited him to him as righteousness. So what do you believe today? There are many promises that God has given us and you know, God, God wants to fulfill that promise to us. And he wants us not to look at our circumstances, but to look to him, you know, look to Jesus and, and, and see that you know, see that the, the promise that God has promised you, to see it and call it to being. That's what, uh, if, what God did to Abraham. He went, took him outside to see the stars. 
to see that the stars are so nu numerous that he, can, he can't count all of them. And he said, this will be your descendants. So because of the promise that, that uh, Abraham received, you know, Isaac was his promise and he became the father of all nations. In verse 18, he says, against all hope, Abraham believed and so he became the father of many nations just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. You know, so God came true for him and, and you know, the promise didn't come immediately but, but it eventually came. Uh, but Abraham was steadfast and he did not doubt in the ability of God to give him that promise. So today, you have been justified by the righteousness of Jesus. There is now no more condemnation. So don't let your past or the circumstances say that you, know, you are not righteous and that you do not deserve God's blessing, that He won't answer your prayers because you have not been a good Christian or you have not done this or you have not done that. But you know, just believe that His righteousness is always there for you. That, you know, it, it is an everlasting righteousness that God will never take it away from you because He has, we have been uh, made uh, right with God. We, we have a right standing. And today, Jesus said that we are seated at the right hand with God together with Christ and join heirs with Him. And He was the seed. He was the seed uh, Jesus was the seed that God promised that through Abraham that all the nations would be blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. So lastly, I just want to encourage all of us to always have a good opinion of our God. Okay. Um, don't use our human experience or the circumstances to disqualify God's promise. But let's stand on the truth of God's word that His promises is the truth and that He is a faithful God. He, he is a God that would not lie. He is a God that would not say things if He did not mean it. He is a God that would honour His word. If He says that by his stripes, we are already healed, then let that be so. You know, that we are already healed. It's just that the physical manifestation is not there yet. You know, even though we see the signs of, uh, of the sickness, like how Abraham and Sarah, they were still old, they were still barren, they were still, uh, uh, you know, in, in difficulty in conceiving. But that did not stop them from believing that Isaac would come, the promise would come. So likewise, don't disqualify uh, the promises of God. It is guaranteed by grace when we believe and seal with His blood. You know, God loves us so much that He, he died on the cross and uh, He was, you know, He, was, uh, he suffered so much uh, on the cross, he was beaten, he was bruised, he was pierced, he was spat on, he was humiliated, he was made naked. And, you know, this speaks of the burnt offering uh, of, uh, of Jesus where he, he, was, he, he suffered the torture, he, he suffered the, the, the suffering on the cross. And you know, in a burnt offering, the lamb or the animal is skinned before it's burnt. And you know, Jesus, and, and you know, when Adam first sinned and, and, and they were naked and they were ashamed of their nakedness, God killed the animal and, and, and took the skin and clothed them, clothed their, their shame, you know, and covered their nakedness. It is a picture of God's righteousness that covered, that covered uh, Adam and Eve and that is covering us today. It is His 
the skin of Jesus. You know, when he was whipped, they say that he was whipped until there was no more skin on his back to signify that, you know, God really loves us and he was willing to go through that kind of suffering so that he can rope us with his righteousness. The skin that he bore on his back was torn so that he can, it can cover our shame, our guilt, that today we can have a right standing before God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's close. This morning, if you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you have not received uh, God's righteousness, today is a good day for you, as any day, to receive salvation, to receive God's, um, God's righteousness by faith. You know, God wants to bless you, God wants to uh, help you, whatever problems that you're facing, and and God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. You know, it's not about religion, it's not about doing good or doing bad, but it's about believing, believing on the one true God who loves you, who has given so much to you. So this morning, if you want to, uh, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. You took my punishment that was supposed to be uh, suffered by me. Father, I thank you, Lord, that not only you died for my sins, but you also provide me with your righteousness so that I can have a right standing, so that I can be justified. I thank you that you overcame death. And today, I can live forevermore with you, together with you, that I have eternal life. Father, I just ask that, Lord, that uh, I invite you to be my Lord and Saviour, that, that you come and, and fill me with your spirit and, and teach me your ways and, and help me live my life. In Jesus' name I pray. If you say that prayer, praise God, you are now uh, a child of God and all heaven is, is rejoicing. And uh, it would be good if you can contact us. Maybe at the end we have our Zoom prayer session. You can, you can contact us and uh, we can pray with you and help you in your new beginning with the Lord. And for the rest of us, we just, I just want to pray uh, that, Lord, that, uh, that the Lord will just continue to watch over us, uh, that He will continue to take care of our family, our lives, and keep us safe, keep us healthy, our going in and coming out, and that He will protect our mind from the attacks of the enemy, that we will continue to be steadfast, not wavering, uh, that, that, you know, to, to possess... The, the land, the promises that God has already given to us and that we will remain steadfast as we look to Jesus. Amen. So Father, we just thank you for this time and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.